we begin a series which is going to be very personal because, of course, prayer is the means of communication with our God. So I want to start with a very simple and straightforward this evening. And this is a quotation from the book which bears, of course, the title that we're using for this series of studies, The, the Principles and Power of Prayer. Brother Mansfield wrote in that book about the importance of prayer. He wrote, when we open the word of God, God speaks to us. When we engage in prayer, we speak to him. The person who studies all the time but never prays is like those dull companions who are always ready to listen but never contribute anything to the conversation. There is nothing stimulating in such company. On the other hand, the person who is always praying and, but never studying is like those garrulous people who dominate all conversation and are never ready to listen to what others might like to say. Such conversationalists soon bore us. The ideal companion, and that's what God's looking for, brothers and sisters, is one who is prepared both to listen and to talk, to interchange thoughts and conversation. His presence gives us pleasure and we delight to converse with him. So there are some very, very simple principles to begin our series with. Obviously, God speaks to us through his word. We return to him the words of prayer. Prayer is about a relationship with Yahweh our God. It is, in fact, the touchstone of the quality of that relationship. Both the quality and the regularity of prayer is actually a barometer of spiritual health. It tells us where we are on the scale of spiritual health. And of course, that really makes it very personal, doesn't it? It comes back to where we stand in relation to this matter with our God. Now, we read from Psalm 141 this evening because, of course, it has that wonderful little passage in it in verse 2. Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense. And we're going to focus for the first half of this study tonight on incense as a symbol for prayer. So here we've got that quotation, Psalm 141, verse 2. And Brother Mansfield wrote these words. I'm not going to read all of them. I just pick the eyes out of what he says here in relation to this matter of incense. Because, of course, it was the practice in Israel under the Mosaic system for the priests to burn incense morning and evening, which, of course, must be the very raw bones of prayer. I mean, if we can't do it morning and evening, at least then we're probably in trouble. So Yahweh was teaching his people, at least morning and evening. And of course, there were two altars involved in this. Coals were taken from the brazen altar of sacrifice, which was, of course, outside the tabernacle itself, in the courtyard. Coals were taken from that altar and brought by the priest inside the holy place where those coals were used to burn the incense. So two altars are involved here. There's a brazen altar, which of course speaks of sacrifice, an altar, sacrifice, but brass also is the symbol for flesh. So here is the principle of the flesh being sacrificed in order to provide prayer in a holy place. Get the principle of that, brothers and sisters? And if we can't make the time during our day, like Daniel did, three times a day, I don't think anybody in this room, in their careers, in their work life, or their home life, has ever been busier than Daniel. He was probably the most busy Christadelphian in history. He ran the kingdom of Babylon. Think about that. But he was able to make, even with opposition, he was able to make three times a day Regular prayer to his God, and he insisted on it, and they knew he insisted on it. What about us, brothers and sisters? How much sacrifice goes into our prayers day by day? Again, that's a matter we've, we can only answer for ourselves. So here we've got the principles that begin with the establishment of certain things under the law of Moses. We want to explore a few of those. You might recall, of course, that the very first day of the operation of the law of Moses under the Aaronic priesthood was an absolute disaster because Nadab and Abihu, the two older sons of Aaron, brought in coals, not from the order of sacrifice, but from their own barbecue. 
they thought that that would be acceptable to God. They were probably most likely inebriated. And again, there's a, there's a warning there. We must, brothers and sisters and young people, pray as God requires us to pray, not as we think we should. And that was a lesson that Nadab and Abihu would have learned the hard way. What about these two verses that you can see here, Malachi chapter 1, verse 11, and Revelation chapter 8, verse 3? Well, here they are, but to save a little bit of time, you can look it up if you wish. It's on the screen. This is Malachi chapter 1, verse 11, about a time yet to come, not that far away, where Yahweh gives this prophecy. For from the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. And in every place, incense shall be offered unto my name. Now, he could have said, couldn't he? Prayer will be offered unto my name. He doesn't. He uses incense as a symbol of prayer. And a pure offering, for my name shall be great among the nations, saith Yahweh of armies. What about Revelation 8 verse 3, the other end of the Bible? And another angel, we read, came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, just like the priest used under the law. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar. That's the altar of incense, which was before the throne. So we see, just by those couple of references, three references in fact, these three, Psalm 141, Malachi 1, 11, and Revelation 8, verse 3, and you could add to that several others, that incense plays a very, very important part in the matter of prayer. So what we're going to do is have a look at the creation of the incense under the law of Moses and see what it can teach us about prayer. The manufacture of incense for use in the tabernacle and later the temple was strictly governed by a divine prescription. Now that prescription is in Exodus chapter 30, verses 34 to 36, which you might like to turn up because that's where we're going next. In Exodus 30, we've got that prescription for incense. Man was not to tamper with it in any way or add his own ideas. So accordingly, our prayers need to be in harmony with God's will and prescription. Now you remember Cain, of course, when he brought along his offering and it was rejected and he ultimately killed his brother, of whom he was envious. You'll remember that Cain was rejected because he did not do it in accordance with the divine prescription. He wanted to create his own religion. He wanted to impose upon God his will. That is, of course, very dangerous, as Nadab and Abihu learned. So in our study of prayer, we will avoid giving personal opinions. We'll put before you the word of God alone. It'll be up to you to be the judge. This is how, of course, Yahweh woke his son up every morning. Imagine being woken up with the voice of God in your ear. Isaiah chapter 50 verses 4 and 5 tells us that that was the experience of Christ. Can you imagine that Christ being woken up with the voice of God, which is a bit like us getting up and doing our readings, would not, once that voice ceased, pray, return words to his father? Of course he would. So there you've got this wonderful balance. So the principle we're going to use is that of Isaiah chapter 8. True disciples, and the word disciple, of course, is used in Isaiah 50 of our Lord Jesus Christ. We want to be true disciples. And... Isaiah chapter 8 verse 16 says, seal up the word with my disciples. And if they turn not to this word, it is because there is no light in them. That's going to be the basis which we're going to use. So the overarching principles that will govern our study, brothers and sisters and young people, are these. There's a few passages I want to bring before you. Here's the first one. You don't need to turn these up. I hope you've got Exodus chapter 30 open. We'll get there in a second. But these are the principles we want to use as the overarching, overshadowing principles of our study. For thus saith the high and lofty one, we read in Isaiah 57 and verse 15, that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Now that 
of course, sets forth some fundamental principles. Yahweh wants to dwell with his people, but he can only do so when there is a contrite and humble spirit. And Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 7 and 11, 11 to 12 tell us that we must have no confidence in our own understanding and we have a need for acceptance of discipline along the way. In fact, you might recall that Psalm 141 made the point. The psalmist said, let the righteous smite me and it will be like a good oil. Okay? So you might feel at times as we go through the study that you're being smitten was not me. Not me that's doing the smiting. All I'll be doing is laying before you the scripture. Now these are the two passages in Proverbs that we've just quoted. Proverbs 3, 5 to 7. Trust in Yahweh with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear Yahweh and depart from evil. Verses 11 and 12 say, My son, despise not the chastening of Yahweh, neither be weary of his correction. For whom Yahweh loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. And of course, that leads us to Ecclesiastes chapter 5, and a recognition, an acceptance, a humble acceptance of our position before our God, to show to him the respect and the honour that is due to him. We're familiar with these words of Ecclesiastes 5, aren't we? Verses 1 and 2. Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools like Nadab and Abihu. For they consider not that they do evil. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. And as a final point, brothers and sisters and young people, Isaiah 42 verse 8 says this, that whatever we may think, God will never abdicate his position of righteousness. He says in Isaiah 42 verse 8, I am Yahweh, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. So I think we can see the need for humility in this matter. I think we can see the need for the acceptance of whatever the word requires of us. Let us not put up our own thinking against it. Let us accept it and let's, brothers and sisters, build that relationship with our God that will give him pleasure. So if you're in Exodus chapter 30, come to towards the end of the chapter to verse 34. Now verse 34 we're going to focus on because it's got the ingredients of incense, but I'm not going to read that verse first. I'm going to read verse 35. This is what it says. And thou shalt make it, that is the incense, described in verse 34, a perfume. A perfume, of course, is something that smells very sweet. After the art of the apocryphy or the chemist. You know what that's telling us, brothers and sisters? Prayer is actually an art form. It is the greatest form of art that we can practice. Now, you know what artists do? You know, you have to have a little bit of maybe natural talent to get anywhere, but you can be an artist, anybody can be an artist, providing you practice, providing you're diligent, providing it is the core of your life. Prayer is an art form. I don't know about you, but I'm not sure that I've reached any sort of artistry just yet, but I'm trying, and I know you're trying too. So let's, when we consider the, the actual ingredients that Yahweh specifies and the rules that governed those ingredients, let's see if we can learn some lessons about prayer, the kind of prayer he wants to hear from us. So what's the first one in verse 34? It says, And Yahweh said unto Moses, Take unto thee sweet spices. The word in the Hebrew simply means to, to smell sweet, to be aromatic. So these spices were going to give off a beautiful odour. It wasn't going to be unpleasant, beautiful, in the, as it were in the nostrils of the Almighty. And the first of those sweet spices is stacti. Now stacti is the Hebrew word nataf. It means a liquid drop 
very suggestive of a tear, like a tear dropping from your eye. Stacty is a kind of myrrh. It's obtained by inserting a deep gash in the branches of a tree and collecting the liquid. Of course, that clearly, when you gash a tree, it suggests the principle of sacrifice is involved here. No prayer will be acceptable to Yahweh unless the one offering it is prepared to subordinate his will to the will of the Father, as our Lord did, of course, in the garden. Luke 22, 44. Not my will, but thine be done. So the attitude of the Lord is that which is required. And that means sacrifice of self-interest if necessary. The next ingredient is onica in verse 34. Now this Hebrew word, shekaleth, denotes the onica, a nail fish from its form. It was made from the white seashell that the Israelites found on the shores of the Red Sea. So, of course, when they crossed over the Red Sea, they would have an opportunity to pick up some of these shells and carry them. And they were to be used in the wilderness journey for the manufacture of portion of this incense. It reminded Israel, of course, of their deliverance from Egypt. Every time that they took these shells and crushed them that came from the Red Sea, they would be reminded of the fact that God had delivered them from Egypt. Now, when Onik was burned, it gave forth a very pleasant odour. Indicative, of course, of the sense of gratitude that, that is, the Israelites would have felt because of their deliverance from bondage. When they contemplated what God had done for them, that caused them to feel this sense of gratitude towards their father. The next ingredient was galbanum. The Hebrew word here is chelbana, probably from kalei, meaning milk or gum, and laven or laban, meaning white. It's a gummy, resinous juice of a, of a flower that looks like an umbrella when it bursts forth. When any part of the plant is broken, there issues out a little thin juice of a cream colour, of a fat, like it's a fatty sort of feel to it. But it's a tough substance like gum, and when you look at it carefully, it's composed of many small shining grains, a strong piercing smell and a sharp warm taste, one of the most powerful ingredients of incense. It was acrid smelling when it was burnt. It is said that its main use in ancient times was to keep serpents away. I think you agree that's a significant element in relation to prayer. As one of our writers once said, prayer and sin cannot dwell together. If you're praying earnestly for God to help you, it's unlikely that you'll be under the control of your flesh. So keeping serpents away is a very important part of prayer. And of course, in relation to the fatty feel of this gum, the fat of the sacrificial offerings was always burnt on the altar. Leviticus 3, 16 and 17. It was, of course, God's part of the sacrifice, always given to him symbolising the worshipper's energy consumed in divine service. Now the next ingredient, the fourth, is frankincense. I think it's interesting it's four. You know why that's important, brothers and sisters? Four is the biblical number for righteousness and God manifestation. So here we've got frankincense. Labona is the, is the Hebrew word. It's a white resin burned as a fragrant incense. It was obtained from a spice tree which yielded white gum at the slightest scratch. You scratched the bark of the tree and out it came. It signified whiteness, the symbol of purity, of course, or righteousness. So prayer should be such, pure, without false motives or ostentation. Its instant emergence when the tree is scratched speaks of the constant use of prayer on all occasions, particularly when under pressure. Little wonder then that the psalmist could write in Psalm 141 and verse 2, let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense. Now there were certain laws that governed the use of this incense. Notice the end of verse 34. It says, of each shall there be a like weight. Now we are very much inclined, I think you'll agree, to getting things out of balance. 
That's just the way we are as human beings. You know, I want more of that because I'm more inclined towards that and I'll have less of that because I'm less inclined towards that. When it comes to this matter of prayer, brothers and sisters, God wants balance. He, he wants balance. All four ingredients had to be of equal weight. You couldn't have one heavier than the other. What was that telling them? Well, every aspect of prayer symbolised by the individual elements of the compound and incense was to be in equal measure. Therefore... Prayers individual or delivered on behalf of the community need to be balanced with, and these are the principles that we've just been considering, submission to the divine will. That is the absence of self-interest. The humility of gratitude and appreciation. The spirit that desires to be delivered from evil so that energy may be put into divine service. And that also hungers for righteousness through building a close relationship with God by constant prayer. Now, one of the things that we intend to do in this series of studies is to spend a little bit of time on the practical application of the things that we learn. So that we'll have exposition of certain aspects concerning prayer, and then we'll have a look at the practical application of that, brothers and sisters and young people. I'm fully aware, of course, that a lot of the detail that we say from a platform within a couple of weeks will be gone. Hopefully, we'll, that what will not be gone is one or two practical suggestions based on that information that we can carry through the rest of our lives. I'm still learning. I've been in the truth for 52 years. I'm still learning when it comes to prayer. Anybody here not still learning? No, we've all got deficiencies in this matter. So we can all learn something and we want to talk practically about what we can learn. So there's three things I want to talk about in this little batch of practical things. I want to talk about the movement of lips without audibility, that is, in our personal prayers. I want to talk about prayers in the thoughts of the mind, where no movement of lips or no audible sound is heard. And I want to talk about public prayer. So I've chosen three contexts. The first of those is 1 Samuel chapter 1. Now you're pretty well aware of where I'm going. 1 Samuel chapter 1, of course, is about Hannah. And we know her story well. Now, as you can see from the head of this slide, we ask this question. When to pray aloud or in silence? And why is the movement of lips important? We want to just consider that. Let's pick this up from verse 9. We know, of course, the heartache of Hannah, the difficulties that she was having at home, the, the fact that she could not bring forth a son <coughs> to Elkanah, her husband, while the other wife did. So verse 9 says, so, so Hannah arose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by the post of the temple of Yahweh. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto Yahweh and wept sore. So you just get a bit of picture in your mind of this, this wonderful sister in, in the truth, sitting there on a, probably a hard bench, and over the way is Eli the high priest, and inside that tabernacle, Shiloh, are two of the most horrendous men that ever put on a priestly robe. The two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas. And they had, of course... They had turned the hearts of the people of Israel against coming up to the tabernacle. We're told that in 1 Samuel 2 and verse 17. Wherefore the sin of the young men, it says, was very great before Yahweh, for men abhorred the offering of Yahweh. It was not an easy time in ecclesial life. And Hannah was in that environment. So there's the picture. Now let's look and see what she does. Verse 13. Now Hannah... She spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunken. He was quick to condemn her, not his own sons. And Eli, of course, upbraids her, and she explains in verse 15, Hannah answered and said, No, my lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before Yahweh. So what do we learn from this? 
brothers and sisters and young people. You know what our Lord thought about loud, repetitive prayer? Matthew 6, verses 5 and 7. He condemns it. Because those prayers are designed to draw attention to oneself, not to Yahweh. Man is glorified, not God. So the key issue here, and we see it in Hannah, is the reality of God and the reverence owed to him. So Hannah believed in the reality of Yahweh, regardless of what she could see around us and the degeneration of the priests and the awful things that were happening, even at the door of the tabernacle, while she's sitting there, she believed in Yahweh. Only her lips moved in her prayer. Her voice was not heard. Now, we know that the Lord said in Luke 6, verse 45, for of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And that's where it was coming from. She didn't want her words to be heard by those who surrounded her. She wanted them to be heard only by God. So why does she move her lips? Well, it took me a long time to learn the value of this, brothers and sisters. For the last 10 or 15 years, I've been practicing the Hannah approach to prayer. So that I try and distance myself from anybody that can hear. And now it's easy to find a spot like that. And I move my lips. Now, why is that important? Well, anybody in the last minute here has not heard what I've said? Well, there will be a couple. Because, you see, when, when the brain is left just to work by itself, it will go off in all sorts of directions. How often have you been praying in your mind and also thinking about something else? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you will find it a whole lot easier to keep your concentration if, in fact, the brain is in gear with the tongue. No words coming out, no audible sound, but you're actually forming those words. Like I'm forming them now in my mouth. You form the words of your prayer in your mouth, no audible sound. Because the brain is locked in gear with the tongue, it's very difficult to get off track. It's very difficult for the brain to say, now listen, I just want to go and think about what I'm going to do when I go shopping. Okay? I have found that extremely useful, and I would commend it to you. Hannah is a good example of the success of that. So there's the first thing, the value. The value of using the tongue to form words in the act of prayer without actually any sound. When rational thought cooperates with tongue to produce carefully considered words that are articulated by the inaudible movement of the lips, there is evidence of genuinely heartfelt sentiments. Such was Hannah's example worthy of exemplification. Now the second matter is that there are going to be times when you can't do that. So come to Nehemiah chapter 2. Now you realise of course why I'm going here. We know the scene of Nehemiah, who was a very responsible Jew, who had the task of tasting the king's wine, because of course there was always people trying to poison the king. So I don't know that that's the safest job in the world, but that's what, that was his job. He had to taste the king's wine before it was taken by the king. And of course, you couldn't come in before the king if you had that kind of job with a sad face, because the king would say, I think he might be plotting against me. All right, so he was in danger on this occasion. And you know the story well. Let's pick this up from, let's just read the end of verse 1. I took up the wine and gave it unto the king, and now I had not been before time sat in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why are you sad? You're not sick. This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. And Nehemiah says, I was sore afraid. And you would be, wouldn't you? Because the king could say to his soldiers, to his guards, cut that man's head off. Simple as that. And said unto the king, verse 3, let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad? So he explains why he was sad, because of the ruin of Jerusalem. In verse 4, we read this. Then the king said unto me, for what dost thou make request? Now, just paint that picture. This is the thing we must do when you come to the scripture. Paint the picture. Put yourself in Nehemiah's shoes. 
And the king says to him, what's your request? How long have you got? Most of us would blurt out the request, wouldn't we? We'd blurt it out, thinking that any gap between the, the king's request and our response would be dangerous. Not Nehemiah. This is what it says. So I prayed to the God of heaven. Now clearly there were no audible words. I mean, clearly there was no movement of the lips, was there? This was a prayer entirely in the brain. A connection between his thoughts and Yahweh in heaven. Now there are times, of course, when that's most necessary. So that's another thing that we need to practice. Well, I tell you, brothers and sisters and young people, there are going to be many experiences in life where if you don't do that, you're going to be in serious trouble. We need to do that when we are in that situation that Nehemiah found himself in. I don't get on this platform, I'm not doing it, there's no boasting in this, this is telling you my dependence, brothers and sisters, I never get up out of the chair without doing exactly that. I have no strength of my own. I need the help. Can't always say that you get the help you'd like, but I need it. So there's something that we can practice. I want you to come then to Nehemiah chapter 9. Now we go now to public prayer. Now we're not going to go through this chapter of course verse by verse, that would be ridiculous. Still be here tomorrow. But I am going to summarise this prayer for you. Now it is thought that this prayer was actually composed by Ezra, the scribe, greatest priest of his time. And that it was delivered by the Levites. And you see that in verse 4 of Nehemiah chapter 9. Then stood up upon the stairs of the Levites, and then it gives you their names. And they read out from a document, clearly from a document. This prayer was designed to bring home to the people a deep sense of responsibility, to reveal to them the cause of failure of that people in the past, and to give them an incentive for the future. So it's preceded by the study of the word. Have a look at what we read in verse 3. And they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of Yahweh, their God, one fourth part of the day. You know how many hours that is? That's three hours. You want to hope that I don't go on for three hours tonight, okay? You, it won't be three hours. They studied the Bible in a, as a community for three hours. We shouldn't be complaining about the length of our study classes. Then it says this, and another fourth part, they confessed. Three hours of confession, really? And worship Yahweh their God. So confession and worship for another three hours. Then the prayer is read out. So what does this prayer contain? In verses 5 to 6, we've got the omnipresent power and greatness of Yahweh recognised and acknowledged. In verses 7 to 12, their Abrahamic heritage and its promised deliverance is remembered. In verses 13 to 15, the critical importance of literal and spiritual bread and water is emphasised. In verses 16 to 18, there's a history of apostasy and rebellion recounted and confessed. In verses 19 to 25, there's the mercy of Yahweh celebrated. In verses 26 to 31, disobedience and rebellion justly but mercifully punished. They acknowledge that. In verses 32 to 37, there's humble recognition that present difficulties stem from past indiscretions. And isn't that true? And, and in verse 38, there's an appeal that lessons from the past might inform and improve the future. Now, that's what I call a real, full public prayer. What can we learn from that, brothers and sisters, particularly brethren who have to offer prayers on behalf of the community? I ask a simple question. Unless you are very lucid, and there are a few like that, how much preparation do you put in to your public prayers? Now, I'm not suggesting you need to read out your prayers. I don't find that easy. Some brethren do. But I do suggest that there is a need, a greater need than we probably recognise for a little bit more effort in the preparation of prayers publicly delivered. I've heard some absolutely fabulous public prayers by brethren, and at least 50% of its content 
was actual quotations from the word of God itself, carefully selected. You can't get any better than that. And so, brothers and sisters, particularly brethren, there is a need for us to reflect upon how we go about preparing and delivering public prayers. Another practical matter, head coverings for sisters. Yeah, I'm going to address that. Can you come to 1 Corinthians chapter 11? The one thing that emerges from any fair consideration of 1 Corinthians 11 is that the apostle uses the principles established in Genesis, particularly the time of the creation. They take centre stage when he comes to deal with these matters, such as the, head, the wearing of a head covering by sisters in the meetings. Let me just introduce this by saying just a, a couple of things. We know probably that the practice was in the very early days of the first century ecclesia in Jerusalem that they held a memorial meeting every night. So every evening meal was attended by a memorial meeting in the book of Acts, in the early days of the ecclesia. But what, by the time we get into the AD 50s and 60s, when the apostle is getting towards the end of his work, particularly amongst the Gentiles, it's, it's seemingly apparent but they only had one meeting, and that was on the first day of the week. They had one meeting. Not like us, we have like 14 meetings a week, don't we? We have two or three on Sunday, and sometimes nearly every second Saturday, and every Wednesday. So we have several meetings during... They didn't do that. They had one meeting. And the Apostle uses a simple phrase in this chapter. He uses the phrase, verse 17, When ye come together... All right, and they used to come together for one occasion. That was for the memorial meeting. They used to have a meal. That's obvious from this chapter. They had a meal, and that was abused by the Corinthians, and that's what this chapter's about. But he's only really talking about one meeting. So what are the principles involved here? Well, in the early part of this chapter, there's the primary need for humble recognition of the divine hierarchy set forth in the beginning. And that hierarchy is spelled out for us in verses 3 and 4. Verse 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. So there's our hierarchy. God, Christ, man, woman. And of course we know why the woman was subjected to the man in the primacy of his creation, that's what the Apostle says in 1 Timothy 2 verse 13, Adam was created first, the primacy of his creation, then she was taken from him, so that of itself saw her subjection to him. But then of course there was a second matter the Apostle raises in 1 Timothy 2, when he says that Eve, the woman, was the first in the transgression. She's not blamed, by the way, for the introduction of sin in the world, because Adam went in with his eyes wide open. She was deceived. She was utterly deceived. But she was the first in the transgression. So there's a second reason for her subjection. So there's a need for an acknowledgement based on that hierarchy of the headship of those who are in echelon above us. Now, recognition that it was Adam that was made in both the image, that is the shape, and the glory, that is the mental and moral capacity of God, or the Elohim, while the woman only shares the latter. That's important. That's verse 7 of 1 Corinthians 11. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image, the icon, the shape, and the glory, meaning the mental and moral capacity, of God. But the woman is the glory of the man. He doesn't say the woman is the image and glory of the man. The last time I looked at my wife, she was in a slightly different shape than me. And I'm very thankful for that. So you see, it's the man who was made in the likeness of the Elohim. So there's the principles that are based upon Genesis chapter 1. 
So in verses 4 and 5 of this chapter, the apostle is laying before the Corinthians, and there was trouble in that ecclesia over this matter. Some of the sisters were clearly not wearing a head covering to the meeting. Acceptance that a man praying with head covered dishonours Christ, his spiritual head. So if I come into the meeting wearing a hat, this is why we ask when we give prayers at picnics and the like, we suggest, we should, we should suggest that brethren and young men remove their caps, remove their hats. Why? Because of this principle. We do not want to be walking on thin ice. Paul makes it plain when it comes to prayer, if a man's got a head covering, he dishonours his head. So who's his head? Christ. Yeah. I don't think I want to be in that boat. Then, of course, he says this, that a woman who fails to cover her head dishonours her head, her spiritual head. Who's that? Her husband. And that needs to be thought about. Come to verse 10, where the apostle says this, For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. So the knowledgeable and humble sister places what's called here a sign on her head to indicate her appreciation and acceptance of the principles established in Eden. Those principles, of course, established by the arrangements put in place by the angels. But also bear in mind, of course, that the angels take careful note and are recording, brothers and sisters, the things that we do for the day of interview, which is not too far away. And we need to be conscious of the presence of the angels. They were there in the beginning. They are here now. They are taking note of what we do. Now, this word rendered here, power, see the word power in verse 10, is the Greek word exousia which essentially means delegated authority. You're given authority. Someone more important, more powerful than you says to you, you can represent me, here is my authority, I delegate it to you, go away and get the job done. That's what that word means. And I think this is very important. In 50 years of marriage, tomorrow, 50 years of marriage, my lovely wife has asked me only a couple of times, should I wear a hat to this engagement or that meeting or something else? And she hasn't got an answer from me. Not the answer she was looking for. And the reason she hasn't got an answer from me is that she has got the delegated authority to make that decision. If I say to her, yes, you will wear a hat, that's not what Paul's talking about. He's talking about the humble acceptance of the divine principles by the individual. It's not imposed upon them. She's got the delegated authority and she should use it. That's what the apostle's talking about. Thankfully, I haven't had to say very much. You need to think about that. Sisters, it is important that sisters understand why a head covering is required and that they make a personal choice to humbly adopt the practice. They have that delegated authority to willingly conform to divine principles. However, the apostle knew there would be people who would say, well, I'm not going to do that. Look at my hair. It's a covering. See what he says here? Come down to verse, to verse 15 of chapter 11. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her. And that's the problem. Isn't it? For her hair is given her for a covering. So people say, well, there you are. My hair is my covering. Sadly, for them, Paul doesn't use the word for covering that he uses in verse 6. You see what he says at the end of verse 6? It's a shame, he says, for a woman to be shorn or shaven. So let her be covered. And the word covered there, catacolupto, means to cover wholly. That is, uh, to veil, to conceal. When we come to verse 15, the word covering there is a totally different Greek word. It is peri, which means around, peri 
And that means something thrown around one. It's rendered in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 12 twice as vesture. Now why do you put on a vesture? Well, to draw attention to yourself. You put on a lovely garment so that people say, Ooh, isn't that lovely? And brethren, you will know. You will know from your experience. I've often walked down a street behind a woman with lovely hair. And I can't wait to get around the other side to see what her face looks like. And all too often I'm disappointed. <laughs> Isn't that true? I mean, it's the hair. It's the hair that's the glory. And that's what needs to be covered, says the apostle. But what about the argumentative? What about those who rebel? Well, look what he says in verse 16. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her. He says, but if any man, now that word man is not in the Greek. It should read, if any one, and he has in mind women here. If anyone seemed to be contentious, and there were some like that in Corinth, we have no such custom. What custom? The custom of using your hair as a covering. We have no such custom, neither the ecclesias of God. Sadly, brothers and sisters, if Paul was here today, he couldn't write that. He would not be able to write that. And that's one of the tragedies of our community. So what have we learned? Well, we learned this. And Brother Mansfield, in his little book, on page six, says this. If we feel that our prayers are inadequate or ineffectual and desire to make them more powerful, we must seek the means of doing so from the instruction of the word. All the principles that go to make prayer powerful are set forth and reiterated in scripture. They are there for our seeking. So these are the governing principles that will overshadow our studies on this subject. Yahweh does hear the prayers of the righteous. We know that many testimonies speak of that. And nothing is too hard for him. That's why we should bring everything before him. He will never abdicate his righteousness or submerge his principles. So every request should be as best as possible, be in harmony with his will. He always answers, but his answers may come in various forms. Maybe silence. Why? Because silence is the best for his servants at that particular time. There may be delay for the same reason. Or, as in the case of Abraham's servant, brethren and sisters, remember him in Genesis 24? He could hardly believe it. He is praying earnestly that Yahweh might direct him to the woman who would be the wife for Isaac that he was sent to seek. And even before he's finished his prayer, there she is. And he thinks, well, oh, that can't be right. That's too quick. Ever had that experience? Yeah, well, sometimes it's like that. So we, we need to accept, we need to accept whatever the answer is, humbly. So how is prayer answered today? Well, Brother Mansfield says this. It has been assessed that out of over 600 prayers for specific things recorded in the Bible, no less than 450 revealed answers are recorded, which is a pretty good percentage, isn't it? In fact, every prayer is answered, though not always in the way we desire. So without restricting, brothers and sisters and young people, the range of God's ability to respond to our prayers in the latter days, when there is, of course, no open vision given, as there was in the days of Samuel, or gifts of the Spirit, as there was in the days of the apostles. The primary way that God works in our lives today is through divine providence. And that providence is manipulated by the angels who take a great interest in the way that we respond to the principles that they established in the garden so long ago. So ends our first study, brothers and sisters and young people. Next time around, God willing, we'll have a look at the prayers of the patriarchs and learn some lessons from them.